Good morning, everybody who's here in Glasgow today. And a very warm welcome to everyone also who's joining us online from around the world. Today's event is a hybrid event, Dialogues Towards a European Peatland Initiative, which is kindly hosted by the Irish government and supported by national uh, governments and stakeholders from across Europe. Um, we're all here today to also achieve our goal that I think is above my head. I don't know if the online see this, but this 1.5 degrees. So thank you for joining us today and also to everybody who contributed to making this event happen. My name is Siska Devro, and I will be your moderator for today. I'm an engineer and an innovation consultant working across multiple peatland and climate uh, action projects to increase the impact. Today I'm here along with Harm Shooting uh, to make sure that the event runs smoothly and also to keep us in good time, which is important because we have a very packed lineup. Um, I'm Irish myself. Although not a, a bogger, as the people from Dublin commonly refer to the rest of Ireland for obvious reasons. Um, and I'm very proud to have two Irish ministers here with us today. Uh, it's very motivating to see everybody come together and to acknowledge that peatlands matter and that European collaboration is key. So I hope today that we make this COP26 count and that also we create action from this event. Following that, I would like to introduce our speakers for the first section of today's session. We have with us our chair, uh, Malcolm Noonan, the Minister for State of Heritage and Electoral Reform in Ireland. We also have the Minister for Environment and Natural Resources of Iceland, Gundbundir Inge Goodbranson. We also have joining us online, Minister Pippa Hackett, the Minister of State for Land Use and Biodiversity of Ireland. Also, we have Minister of the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety of Germany, uh, Svenja Schultz. So then, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Minister Malcolm Noonan, the chair of today's event, who will tell us a bit more about why we're here today. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, we had a fantastic uh, session this morning, and um, I, I suppose the, the standout moment for me, I suppose, was Anne Gray's reference to uh, the fun by tree and Bananarama. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it, and that's what gets results. And that's really what we're about here with, with peatlands restoration uh, globally. That's what we're trying to achieve collectively. And uh, I I'm feel really inspired by meeting all of the delegates here this morning at this very first peatlands pavilion. I'm, uh, it's incredible that this is the very first peatlands pavilion at COP, but uh, it's going to be the first of, of many. And I think it's um, has been a really uh, inspiring to meet you all here this morning. Um, and again, just uh, to welcome you all to this really important discussion that we're going to have about enhancing uh, meaningful collaboration collaboration across Europe in order to maximize the positive outcomes for all of our peatlands uh, and, our, and our management programs. The protection, conservation, restoration, rehabilitation of the world's peatlands are an essential component of the global response to climate change and to biodiversity loss. Healthy peatland ecosystems sequester more uh, and store carbon, provide habitat for wildlife, filter water and help to mitigate flooding but they also provide valuable recreational amenities that bring communities together and inspire a sense of wonder in all who visit them. And we certainly know this in Ireland to be true. Ireland has the best example of raised bog habitat left in Europe and also the largest extent of upland blanket bog. We have a special responsibility to conserve and restore these special habitats, which are so deeply intertwined with our cultural, social, economic and natural histories. Since Neolithic times, over 5,000 years ago, people have lived in and worked on the bogs of Ireland. Today, many Irish people have childhood memories of time spent out on the bog, and as awareness of their value incre has increased in recent years, more and more of us, myself included, have found new joys in, on, or around them, from feeling the peat of a raised bog quake underfoot and noticing the tiny lichens, wild blueberries, and sundews among the flora, to admiring the broad vista of an upland blanket bog coating a hillside. In Ireland, our newly established National Climate Action Plan and legally binding target of 51% reduction in emissions by 2030 has brought an unprecedented sense of urgency to our efforts to take action for these special habitats, building on work already underway. Ireland is rehabilitating over 33,000 hectares of post-industrial cutaway bog as part of our enhanced decommissioning, restoration and rehabilitation scheme, following the cessation of large-scale harvesting for electricity generation. This scale of this scheme, funded by the European National Resilience and Recovery Fund, is of European and indeed international significance. 
through our National Parks and Wildlife Service, Ireland is also restoring much of our race bog habitats designated as special areas of conservation under the Habitats Directive and those protected under national legislation. The result to date of this work have been very positive and are stimulating new peatland management projects. Meanwhile, the EU Life funded raised bog restoration project, the Living Bog, has restored raised bog habitats across 12 raised bog special areas of conservation and is exceeding its original target to improve the condition of 2,649 hectares of raised bog. These are just a few examples of the work in progress across Irish peatlands. My colleague, Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Pippa Hackett, will share more with you later about how Ireland's work on peatland restoration and rehabilitation interacts with the agricultural sector. And while these examples do represent significant progress, we have much more to do and learn from our friends and colleagues across Europe. I am delighted to see so many European colleagues here this morning and look forward to hearing numerous developments and advancements that are being made in their countries to further the conservation and management of our European peatlands. It is vital that we work together to elevate our national efforts and to achieve, achieve our shared vision for these habitats across Europe. It is urgent that we do it. This event will give us an opportunity to learn from each other and share our knowledge and experience. And there are a number of key questions that I would like to explore today through our conversations. Firstly, what can we learn from each other to enhance and support our work? Across Europe, there are many peatlands projects producing innovative work on peatlands, including amongst others, Carbon Connects, Care Peat, Life Peat Restore, the Repeat Project, and CANIP, along with the ongoing work of Ramsar and Wetlands International that have been developing and piloting techniques, technologies, and business models to sustainably restore, re-wet, and manage our peatlands. How can we best share these learnings? Secondly, how can we work together more effectively to pool resources and to create synergies? I look forward to hearing presentations by numerous experts here this morning on peatlands and their views on the future outlook of peatlands across Europe. I expect there are many opportunities for cross collaboration. For example, in Ireland, the Life Integrated Project Peatlands and People will create a knowledge centre of excellence as regards peatlands restoration and rehabilitation. While this centre will operate as a national hub for Irish scientists and experts, perhaps we should consider how such a centre could be expanded with input and contributions from our European colleagues who have developed their own expertise in the field, such as the world-renowned Griswold Meyer Centre. Thirdly and finally, and, and critically, what shape should these efforts take? With so many challenges surrounding good peatland conservation and with our shared ambition and determination to achieve success, it is important that we build on current exchanges of knowledge and expertise in this field by working together exponentially increases the benefit of each country's individual efforts. So I look forward to the discussions this morning. Uh, I know it's going to be a lively conversation and critically, uh, I think from the conversation, hopefully we will move towards uh, a, a greater understanding and appreciation of how we can move this initiative forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now like to begin our roundtable discussion. In this section, we will bring together ministers to discuss not only what is being done in our individual countries, but also what we can learn from each other. So first, I would like to begin with the Minister for the Environment and Natural Resources of Iceland, Gudmundur Ingi Gudbranson. Yeah, good morning, everyone, again. I was here also this morning, and I think you said that in Ireland you say that you are either boggers or you're not. Well, I'm definitely a bogger <laughs> because I'm, I'm born and bred in a, one of the biggest and, needless to say, most beautiful wetland areas in my country. Um, but it's great to be here at this event, uh, and thank you for organizing it. Um, we look at Irish people as our distant cousins. We have much in common, including peat and peatlands are part of our landscapes and our economic and social history. Um, where I come from, for example, um, 
we have a few sayings that refer to our wetlands and even it's sort of a guidance to navigate through them, especially where I come from, where they are really, really wet. So uh, this is, wetlands are so integrated into our culture as well. Um, but we Icelanders, we have a, we could say a complicated relationship with our peatlands. The country is wet, so we have a lot of wetlands. We have built our houses of turf and peat, and we have used dried peat for heating. And peatlands, they have provided good grazing, and often they also gave good hay for the winter. And they were unpleasant to walk on in a country where shoes were made of sheep hide and sometimes of dried fish skin. And when you read interviews with people coming of age in rural Iceland in the first half of the 20th century, like my grandmother, um, and they are asked about the greatest improvement in life during that time, they do not mention jeeps or tractors or central heating or modern medicine. What they vote for is rubber boots. There is a special type of miserable unhappiness associated with cold and wet feet on soggy ground, wrote one of one author describing her childhood in pre-rubber boot Iceland. So when we had the chance and the technology, one might argue that we declared war on peatlands. Well, that's perhaps overstating it a bit, but the government started generous subsidies for draining wetlands. This was uncontroversial, indeed popular. Ditches were signs of progress. About half of the Icelandic wetlands have been drained and the majority of wetlands in the inhabited lowlands. Subsidies ended mostly in the 1980s, shortly before the Climate Change Convention was signed, and we started to worry about land use emissions. Only after we had drained most of our wetlands in the inhabited part of Iceland did we start having second thoughts. I remember this clearly as I'm born at the end of the 70s. I remember being a proud little lad because of the progress to my family's lands. This was, of course, before I realized that the songs of the birds died as my feet got drier. But once we realized the role of peatlands in, climate change, in the climate change puzzle, we took responsibility. Our scientists measured big carbon emissions from drained peatlands. They also found out that restoring wetlands by filling in ditches stopped these emissions rather quickly. We took these, this lesson to the world. Uh, we suggested that wetland conservation and revetting might be an elective activity in the land use part of the Kyoto Protocol, and this was agreed and incorporated into the protocol in its second commitment period. This was important, as it raised the awareness of the importance of peatlands uh, in a climate context. It also required the IPCC to produce scientific guidelines on the effects of draining wetlands and of restoring them. Now, we in Iceland have actually been a little slow to follow up on this accomplishment. There has been caution among landowners and others about the benefits of restoring drained peatlands. This is understandable. It's puzzling to many to go from government-supported draining of peatlands to government-supported restoration of drained wetlands. But we have now established a program on wetland restoration under our new climate action plan, first published in 2018 and then renewed in 2020. And there are two actions specifically on wetlands in this action plan. It's one on wetland uh, protection and another one uh, on increased funding for restoration efforts. And now, just last September, we expanded on the first action, the wetland protection, and gave out a special policy paper where we, um, <clears throat> where we are concentrating on protected areas and how, how they can help us preserving wetlands by designating new areas for protection status and protecting them by law that way, um, by requiring development consent for new training, and many, many more. So that was an important step. Uh, towards the protection of, of uh, wetlands. And I'm not going to go more um, in detail into the, the funding, but we have uh, really increased uh, restoration efforts by the government. Um, so we also have a private fund for reclaiming drained wetlands, which is engaged in many projects supported by companies and individuals and with the scientific backing of the Soil Conservation Service. So we are seeing peatland restoration taking off as a major factor in Iceland's uh, climate mitigation efforts. And 
yesterday, I, I'm going to get a little bit personal here. I got sent photos of a new restoration project taking on the land of my family. My parents are paying back the wetland debt created as I was a child and before that time. And again, I feel proud, but for another reason now. Proud to see my childhood uh, wetlands being restored, but also proud to be um, taking part in creating something new in my country as a minister where we are uh, trying to change the attitude and morals towards our precious wetlands. And I'm really looking forward to listen to the birds sing again in the box. They aren't really box, but they are wetlands uh, where I come from. So ladies and gentlemen, and everyone outside of these two categories, I want to um, talk a little bit about the lessons in Iceland experience with peatland conservation and restoration. So first, uh, get the science right and follow the science. We listen to our scientists and we have tried to improve the science uh, as it can be quite complex. Emissions vary from the types and thickness of the wetlands. Uh, we have made great progress in this worldwide and in Iceland, and this is crucial. For example, so that we can concentrate on uh, restoring the wetlands that are emitting the most. Now, second, raise awareness. And many find it hard to grasp that inert peatlands with some ditches can release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, there are many misconceptions. It is important to communicate complex science in clear and understandable terms. And we have an experience of this from back home. Now third, skip the blame. Do not blame farmers or others for past draining. This was done in a different era. Before anyone knew about climate change, when agricultural land was scarce, you do not get cooperation from landowners if you scold them for government-supported action many decades ago. And fourth and last, engage landowners, NGOs, and other stakeholders. Some drained wetland is being used for agriculture and other utilization. Landowners have rights. In Iceland, we have large areas of drained wetlands on abandoned farms. We can start peatland restoration there. Many landowners are happy to take part uh, once they understand the value of climate and biodiversity. And even they can take part in the, <coughs> in the restoration itself. And for example, since I mentioned my family's farm and that they started yesterday uh, working on restoration, the farmer, uh, the, the, the farmer on the next farm is actually doing the actual work. So this also benefits the livelihood of the rural areas. Um, we will not be able to fill in 30,000 kilometers of ditches in Iceland in a couple of years. We should start with the low-hanging fruit and work with stakeholders and not against them. Now, I could mention many other things, but my time is definitely up, like always. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, we have lessons to share and we have much to learn. So um, the idea of a European peatland initiative that we are discussing here today as well is an excellent one and timely. So count Iceland in. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I would next really like to introduce the Minister of State for Land Use and Biodiversity of Ireland, Pippa Hackett, who should be here joining us online. I'm here just destroying my laptop. Apologies, I'm not there in person. I was there during the week and it was a, a lovely event and um, it's great to see my, my colleague, Minister Malcolm Noonan there in person. Uh, I suppose I would classify myself a, as a bog girl. So I live in the Midlands of Ireland, uh, very much surrounded by all types of peat uh, from the extraction to the farmed and um, some wonderful um, rehabilitation projects around me also. So listen, it's wonderful to be here today. Uh, thank you very much for, for you know, having me and I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing these discussions later. Look, we really all know the significance um, uh, contribution that European peatlands can make to the, to the challenges of climate change um, and certainly the importance of protecting uh, peatlands um, and organic soils in general and the large carbon pool that they represent. Um, as people probably here know, globally um, it is estimated that despite only covering as little as 3% of global land surface, peatlands are responsible for up to 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions while at the same time also acting as the largest land-based carbon store we have, representing about 42% of all soil carbon. 
So really, uh, um, by providing a, a, an under, understanding of the role that peatlands uh, play in providing not only valuable ecosystem services such as water filtration uh, and biodiversity uh, supports um, implementing a coordinated policy approach uh, for peatlands um, across Europe is going to be a really important uh, mechanism for protecting peatlands and hopefully can be replicated around the world. Uh, but at all stages in this process, um, and as the previous speaker, um, as Minister um, Gutenbranson said, you know, we have to involve uh, communities, we have to involve farmers um, really from the outset. Um, and I suppose in Ireland and in other countries, peatlands, are, you know, they're not only carbon stores, but they have very deep, meaningful cultural meaning for communities. There are places that people have relied on for food and fuel, and certainly in Ireland, you know, our, our peatlands have, have been like a, a mother figure in the Midlands in particular. They've heated our homes, fed our children, warmed, uh, you know, clothed them and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's, to transition away from that is, is, is a challenging, um, challenging thing to do. But I think it's really important that we have this European peatlands initiative um, and utilising um, the just transition mechanism to provide supports to those most affected by the social and economic effects of this necessary transition. The rehabilitation and restoration of Irish bogs is, um, I think, a great example of this mechanism in action. Uh, those who were previously employed in the harvesting of peat um, in the semi-state company board in Amona are now working to re revitalise Ireland's peatlands. We are also here examining um, options for mobilising blended uh, finance for peatlands restoration. Um, the ultimate, ultimate ambition is to build a model that will bring on board businesses, landowners and local communities to drive restoration at a landscape level and work towards achieving those goals we have set ourselves in biodiversity, climate and, and water quality. Ireland has a particular interest in promoting climate friendly initiatives on peat soils, um, especially those under agricultural management. Um, in Ireland, these soils represent between somewhere between seven and nine percent of all of our agricultural area, so it is significant. Uh, recent Irish research has shown high levels of greenhouse gas emissions of up to 32 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare are attributable to these organic soils under agricultural management in Ireland, um, and as such have a considerable impact on the total emissions from the sector. This improved understanding of peatlands emissions has resulted in my government reviewing its ambition for the rewetting of organic soils under agricultural management from an original target of 40,000 hectares to an increased target of 80,000 hectares under our recently launched um, All of Government Climate Action Plan 2021. And to realise this increased ambition, um, our, my government has funded a number of agriculturally specific research projects, which may be of interest to other European countries and people listening here, um, and really maybe in, in areas who are starting down the road of peatlands protection. Uh, from an early stage, we have realised that to implement the correct policies, um, we, we, we must first you know, have access to precise maps showing the location of these farmed peatlands. And to address this, my department has funded two European innovation partnership projects, not only to provide the, the precise location data, but also to begin to understand how farmers and rural communities can be brought on this journey of restoration and protection. The first of these projects is a, is a really innovative mapping project which will seek to transform 100 year old maps to digital format to better inform our target areas. The second project which we have begun to develop um, a template which will aim to develop a results based agri environmental model for organic soils under agricultural management, while also assisting farmers and the broader community to to transition to more suitable uses of peatland resource and to adopt farming practices that will suit this, this, this type of um, management. The two projects, if anyone's interested, you will have maybe have heard of them today already. Um, one is called, the first one is called Repeat, and the second one is called Farm Peat. So um, you know, check them out, see what there is. We can learn what you can pick out of them and, and by all means engage if you want any more information on that. But we're hoping these will be the basis of a new and an innovative model to reward farmers for their efforts in this area. At farm level, um, we, we clearly do recognise the importance of farmer engagement and we are 
also heavily investing investing in the establishment of baseline carbon data on our farms, not only for organic soils, but also for mineral soils. And this has been delivered via a, a pilot soil sampling and analysis program, which will not only provide soil nutrient and pathogen analysis detail for up to 10,000 farmers, um, it will also help to um, ground the results of the previously mentioned mapping project by identifying peat soils at farm level. Another significant development um, in Ireland is the recently funded establishment of a National Agricultural Soil Carbon Observatory, uh, which really involves placing carbon flux towers um, for the measurement of a range of greenhouse gases on a variety of soil types and farm types, types including peat soils. And this initiative will inform government decisions for future land use options as set out under our National Land Use Review, um, which is a commitment under our, our current program for government. To maximise stakeholder engagement, um, these, these flux towers will be located on signpost farms. And this is an initiative supported through my Department of Agriculture funding, where farms representing a variety of soil types, again, and enterprises will act as demonstration farms, um, giving farmers relatable and practical information on climate friendly actions they can implement on their own farms. Um, but we do, however, face challenges in our national efforts to protect peat soils. Um, I suppose one such challenge is to ensure that peatland areas are not only recognised for their, the contribution that their protection will make to our climate, but also to ensure the ecosystem services such as those I previously mentioned in terms of water retention, purification, um, and also biodiversity and amenity value uh, supports. And to fully recognise the range of ecosystem services that peat soils provide to society, um, our central statistics office here in Ireland has been working to put in place a framework of economic values for all ecosystem eco services, which will in time lead to the development of an internationally recognised national capital accounting system for eco services from the land use sector in general, but also from peatlands. And this will raise the possibility of financially rewarding farmers for these ecosystem benefits, which will have significant environmental and social implications. Likewise, work has begun to consider the area of carbon farming um, and how this innovation can be utilised to reward farmers to engage in carbon pool protection and storage friendly management practices, um, which when we consider the large volumes of, of emissions from peatlands, um, this could have significant financial benefits for both farmers and landowners alike. It's clear that peatlands and organic soils in general offer an incredible opportunity to help achieve the ambitious emission reduction targets which are required to avoid the disastrous consequences of global warming. Um, and But early adoption really, uh, you know, of climate beneficial practices is needed and we've heard that all week. Uh, so to ensure that this early adoption occurs, I'm confident that through knowledge transfer and engagement activities uh, across the European community and local communities, um, a pathway can be found to allay fears arising from these interventions, while also providing opportunities and environmental gains for the society at large. So in conclusion, I just hope that the Irish activities, the, the activities we're undertaking, as I've outlined here today, can demonstrate our willingness to act on protecting our peat, peat soils and certainly provide learnings for the European Peatlands Initiative, um, which I fully support in its efforts. So well done and thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to see Ireland and Iceland recognising the importance of peatlands and also what we can learn from each other. I'm now very happy to introduce Minister of the Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety of Germany, Svenja Schultz, who will be giving us a short address followed by a question. Oh, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, Peatland protection was still considered a niche issue just a few, year, few years ago and for no good reason. Peatland protection protects the climate just as biodiversity does and, and it is effective if it is uh, inexpensive and it is low threshold. In other words, it can be implemented without using complex technology. And this is why I'm really delighted that there is now an increased focus on peatland protection uh, as the, at, at this COP too. This is 
a first, but it is an important step. Now the priority has to be practical implementation of peatland conservation and restoration. And um, I'm sorry to say when it comes to peatlands, Germany has hardly been a, a good ro role model uh, in the past. Uh, we have drained 95% of our peatlands and one third of our agricultural greenhouse gas emissions come from the use of uh, degraded uh, peatlands. And this development, which has evolved over a long period of time, now leaves us uh, facing serious uh, challenges uh, today. Um, the German government acknowledged the situation and is now taking corrective uh, action. We have made considerable progress in recent months. We have published a national peatland protection strategy. We have concluded a target agreement with the lander on climate change mitigation through peat soil conservation. By 2025, we will have provided around 330 million euros for re-wetting uh, drained peat soils. We will also promote the introduction of new management practices in this land. Peat extraction is to be phased out. We want no new permits to be uh, issued. The Federal Environment Ministry incorporate a broad participation process when developing uh, national peatland protection strategies. We also drew on uh, expertise in other countries. For example, we hosted a workshop with experts from other European countries and we recognized the urgent need for knowledge sharing on all sides. We have to launch peatland conservation measures as a matter of urgency. It takes a long time before these measures have an impact. And this is why we have to make the most of the opportunity to learn from one another. Many of the challenges uh, we are facing cannot be tackled by individual countries. This is especially true for peat extraction. Ending peat extraction nationally will only lead to actual reductions in greenhouse gas emissions if its extraction is not simply shifted abroad. And ladies and gentlemen, peatland conservation should become an integral part of all long-term climate action strategies. Germany has set itself the goal of cutting its annual greenhouse gas emissions from drained uh, peat soils by at least 5 million tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. This is a huge challenge, but we will only achieve our climate targets if we make swift progress in all areas. And in light of this, I look forward to discussing the establishment of a European peatland conservation initiative. And I would like to thank the Irish government and the many, many institutions supporting the proposal to form such an initiative. One of Germany's uh, declared goals is strengthen cooperation at European and international level. Researchers, policymakers, land users and civil society, we all need more in-depth dialogue to make as much progress as possible on peatland protection and climate change mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, Svenja has to leave us after this, so she won't be here for our Q&A at the end, but we still are very interested to hear what she has to say. So we would like to ask you, from your experience with the peatland protection in Germany, what benefits do you think a European peatland initiative could generate? It's the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When we developed our strategy, we, we learned a lot and we were able to benefit from the knowledge and the experience of other countries and regions. They, they shared that with us and now we are happy to pass in our own experience. And I think we will make much faster progress in peatland conservation if European countries share which, 
with each other what they have learned instead of, of gathering experience individually. Uh, coming together, learning together, I think that is the right way. And um, moreover, there are some, peat some aspects to peatland protection which will, we will not be able to solve as a national level. I've already given an example of uh, peat extraction. We will not achieving a great, uh, great deal with the bans of uh, peat extraction in individual uh, countries. We need a, a coordinated approach involving as many countries as possible. And at the same time, we should cooperate closely with research uh, institutions and industry um, to, to, to quickly find a high quality substitute uh, for peat that are available in uh, insufficient uh, quantities. And only this will ensure that phasing out the use of peat will lead uh, to global reductions in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in my view, from our experience, we need to improve network activities among the, uh, the actors of uh, peatland conservation uh, with regards to nature conservation, with regards to agriculture, we hear that before, with regard to research and with uh, um, concrete measures and, and monitoring. And I think such an initiative uh, is, is really uh, 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 important and that will um, gather a genuine uh, added value if we put uh, all our knowledge together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for those very insightful presentations. It's really wonderful to hear how we can be stronger together towards peatland and climate action. We will now go into the second part of our session today, where we will hear from experts, researchers, and practitioners, also farmers, regarding the state of the art and future outlook in Europe. The aim of this is so that we get a better understanding of the European context, and also how we can establish a collaboration based on needs and common challenges. So to begin, I would like to start with Francisca Tannenberg, the director of the Greifswald Meyer Center. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a bogger. I come from an area where we have a lot of fens, groundwater fed peatlands, and actually the majority of peatlands in Europe are fens. And I'm very proud and very glad that I can pre present a bit of knowledge about European peatlands, really virtually from, uh, provided by hundreds of peatland scientists and conservationists. Um, next slide, please. So let's have a look at the map. This is the map of European peatlands, and we have a lot of peatlands in Europe. It's about one million square kilometers. We have peatlands in 45 European countries. The only country without peatlands at the moment is Malta, but they had peatlands in the past as well. They drained them too early and too strongly. And uh, more than 50% of European peatlands are located in European Russia. So we really need to think of Europe as a biogeographic continent. And yeah, let's have a look at the map that was produced in 2017 in the framework of, uh, next slide please, uh, of this book project. And actually, that's a funny coincidence. Uh, the idea to produce a book about European peatlands uh, was agreed in Dublin, in Ireland in 1991. And then it took 27 years uh, to finish it, so it's a long time effort. Um, but it was finalized together with 134 uh, co-authors from European peatlands from all European countries. And um, we have a nice uh, foreword also uh, from the General Secretary of the Council of Europe, who expressed his interest. He's from, he was from Norway at that time, a peatland rich country as well. And he said that it is a resolutely European book about unity. And I think we also have to think about this in terms of uh, European unity. Next slide, please. We have uh, 10 mire regions in Europe, so we have various types of mires from the north, from uh, polygon mires, um, permafrost uh, driven uh, peatland formation. We have uh, pulsar mires, but then more to the south. We have a lot of box, of course, a lot of fans, and we also have uh, peatlands all uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. So they, um, they are very diverse. Um, and. Um, uh, so these pictures just illustrate the 10 most important Maya regions we have in Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, last year, or this year actually, we did an analysis with the peatland uh, distribution data, which are also part of the global peatland map, which is hanging here in the pavilion, together with uh, a World Conservation Monitoring Center uh, of the United Nations Environment Program. And we combined the data set of protected areas in Europe 
and the area of peatlands. And we had a look to what extent are our European peatlands actually protected. And the outcome was a bit um, sad to, to find out. It is uh, on average, so the total uh, amount is 16% of the European peatland area is within protected areas. And to be honest, a certain part of these protected areas is not designated for the protection of peatlands. It is just that they are within it. So there is something to be done, and it's also very diverse between the Maya regions. So you're invited also to, to have a closer look at this. Next slide, please. We also have a higher degree of degradation in Europe. This is the long-term um, consequences of land use. At that time, people did not know better than to drain it. And what is really important, what was stressed from Iceland here, there is no reason to blame anybody for it. So we all would have drained peatlands in the past, uh, but now we have different times. So this is the degree of degradation. And um, so it, on average, looking at Europe as a continent, 25% of the total peatland area is degraded drained. In the European Union, it is 50%. And we have countries like Germany, for example, where it is more than 90% still, as we heard. Next slide, please. We have large and strong peatland-related networks in Europe. And this is something that European, a potential future European peatland initiative can really build on. So we have networks uh, I mentioned the Council of Europe. We have the, in the European Union, um, uh, we have um, the European Environment Agency, the network of environmental protection uh, agencies in Europe. Uh, we have the European Environment Bureau. We have uh, in the NGO world, we have partners like the BirdLife Network in Europe. Um, we have the International Peatland Society. We have the International Mile Conservation Group. We have Eurosite as a very strong partner, active in many countries. We have Wetlands International European Association the Ramsar network, um, but also then uh, scientific platforms like Society on Ecological Restoration or Society of Wetland Scientists with European chapters, uh, the European uh, Geosciences Union, where all the people meet to do gas measurements. And then, of course, we have agriculture organizations, for example, Copa Cudreca, the platform of European Union farmers, which is very important. Next slide, please. And just to point again at this fact that with uh, revetting peatlands, uh, used for agriculture, also agriculture can gain a lot. So on European average, by revetting 3% of the agricultural land, we can reduce up to one quarter, 25% of emissions from agriculture. Next slide, please. So my last part is the future challenge. So the future challenge is clearly that we need to revet by time, by the coming decades, all peatlands in Europe. So the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree target, implies that we do so. We cannot compensate for, for continued CO2 emissions with planting forests, for example. So this is just for one European country, for Germany, how such a transformation could look like. We have heard a lot what is important, stakeholder involvement, uh, is crucial, and then we can get into the trajectories of IPCC that are needed for the land use sector. Next slide. And this implies a fundamental change of agriculture. So what we are talking about is also to a large extent about agriculture. So we need to shift from conventional agriculture, drainage-based agriculture, to paludiculture or other types of land use on wet peatlands. Next slide. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think it is great that we met here, that we are here together. And uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I think we can do it. Thank you very much, Francisca, for that compelling presentation. I would now like to introduce Dawa Jonkers, who is the director of the Dutch National Intergovernmental Peatland Programme, who is joining us online today. Here we go. Thank you very much. First of all, we want to thank you for the invitation letter to the Dutch Minister of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality, Mrs. Carola Schouten, to participate in this peatland pavilion event. However, Due to urgent formation meetings to come to an agreement on the new Dutch cabinet, Minister Schout is not possible to join this meeting. And I would like to give on her behalf a response and take the opportunity to give a short overview of the Dutch National Peatland Programme using a PowerPoint presentation that I will try to share with you now. I hope you can see it. My name is Dawe Jonkers. I'm the program director of the National Peatland Program at the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality. 
And I am here together in this meeting with my colleague, Chris van Naarden, the R&D officer at the same ministry. To jump into conclusions first, on behalf of the minister, I can inform you that the Netherlands embraces the initiative to come to a European network and that we are willing to participate in such a network aimed at sharing and discussing national peatland policies and strategies and sharing and discussing information on research and development projects and initiatives related to that. And now, having said that, I would like to give you a short introduction to the Dutch National Peatland Programme. But let me start to tell you first where we are in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a flat, pancake-like country in the northwestern part of Europe. It is a delta of four international river basins, the rivers Rhine, Maas, Schelde and Ames. And we have a long history of fighting against water. We have to protect ourselves with dikes and we have to pump away water to keep the dry feet. And at present, approximately 50% of the Netherlands is laying below seawater level or prone to flooding by river water. And the common agricultural structure of peatland in agricultural use looks like this. Long, small agricultural parcels surrounded by water and all drained. Our national peatland policy is part of a Dutch climate agreement from 2018 with the objective to reach one megaton of carbon, di carbon dioxide equivalent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from peatland in agricultural use by 2030. And this agreement was made by a lot of parties. It should be realized through the making of six regional peatland strategies for which the provinces take the lead and to be realized through a bottom up and adaptive approach, learning by doing. And we have a central governmental budget of 200 million euros for regional processes and implementation of no regret measures and 76 million euros budget for research and development. We follow a phased approach, producing regional peatland strategies in three steps. The first this year, 2021, the second in 2023, and the third in 2026, bringing more and more focus to the selection and implementation of specific measures in specific areas. And with the aim to come to an integration of regional objectives, for instance, with respect to the Water Framework Directive, our objectives for Nature 2000 areas, our peat meadow bird strategy, and our menu policy based on European Nitrates Directive. And we have an extensive research and development program, which consists of two parts, a national research program on measuring greenhouse gas emissions from reference sites and experimental sites in different places throughout the Netherlands on peat and peaty soils using different techniques. And we have a national peatland innovation program where we investigate new techniques. And this program is based roughly on three pillars. The first one is to continue dairy farming, but at higher groundwater levels, using reverse drainage systems and infiltration techniques and measures to improve soil structure, such as the application of clay in peat, which seems to reduce the decomposition of peat. But also the second pillar is the cultivation of crops, other crops under wet conditions, such as cranberries or peat moss that can be harvested and used as an alternative for the excavation of peat box outside the Netherlands and the production of common reed and cattail and the production of building materials or even textile from it, which is shown here in this picture. And finally, of course, the transition of agricultural land to natural, natural wetlands. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I want to end my presentation and give the floor back to you. Great, thank you very much, Tower. Then we can move on to our next online speaker. We have Christina Simona Tite, who is the advisor to the Lithuanian Minister of Agriculture. Hi everyone. So I'll share my slide as well. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to participate at this, at this event. Um, I actually had an honor to speak at another event at the Peatland Pavilion earlier this week while I was still in Glasgow, and it was on peatlands in the Baltic states. 
So, um, but this opportunity today is also very much appreciated, uh, being able to share um, in a broader context uh, some of our experiences. So that's what I will do, and in these few minutes, we'll share some of the exciting developments with peatlands and restoration in Lithuania. So um, Lithuania is a uh, small country in the northeast uh, of Europe, and about 10% of Lithuania's area is classified as peatlands. However, um, as we've heard from, from other speakers as well, um, as a peatland-rich country, um, during the late 20th century, many, many of those areas were drained for agriculture primarily, but also for other uses. And today, about two-thirds are damaged and in need of uh, restoration to preserve their great uh, value. So this is a biodiversity, water quality, but also a climate uh, problem, as these uh, damaged peatlands are a major source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, and that's not just in Lithuania's emissions uh, profile, but also globally as well, as our peatlands are among uh, top emitters worldwide. So in light of the UN um, decade on ecosystem restoration and the pressing climate crisis, restoration of peatlands, as you are all, uh, of course, aware, has come to the forefront as one of the obvious natural climate solutions. Um, but what is also a key and, and very important is the need to scale up these restoration efforts. Um, and that is uh, what we are attempting to do in Lithuania with an investment from the EU Recovery and Resilience Facility, or RRF, uh, specifically dedicated to greenhouse gas emissions mitigation to, through revetting of degraded peatlands in the agricultural lands. Um, and we are one of the few EU countries that has proposed such a nature-based measure to the green transformation component of the RRF, in addition to more technological climate solutions. So um, what the measure will entail until the uh, 2026, through this investment, we are planning to restore about 8,000 hectares of peatlands that are currently in agricultural use. While this obviously only scratches the surface in terms of the whole area of damaged peatlands in Lithuania, about, um, um, sorry, it is, it is also a significant step up in our restoration efforts and really a first of its kind and scale initiative in Lithuania. And we need uh, to start somewhere. Um, what is also notable uh, that it, it is a measure proposed and carried out by the Ministry of Agriculture, which I represent. Uh, however, we are expecting later on the Ministry of Environment to join as well uh, through their priority action framework with restoration activities in other non-agricultural areas. So we have this uh, division between the two of us in, in our targets. Um, as we've been developing this uh, investment, um, we, we've been facing quite a few challenges. So uh, for example, a lack of data, including maps, but also the knowledge of uh, people in condition, um, as well as the lack of experience in scaled up uh, restoration activities. Also, it's been quite a, 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 um, complicated to communicate the, both the values of, the, of this investment as well as uh, um, peatland rest restoration in general to the primarily beneficiaries of the investment, that is farmers and other landowners. Um, so we are really trying to um, make, make these clear connections, you know, how these activities will help reach our uh, climate targets for the sector. So it is really important to demonstrate not only the environmental, but also financial gains to them, including in the long run, to encourage their involvement in the recovery of their land. So there are still a lot of questions, um, you know, including on financial support to the farmers, uh, what they will receive after regretting these, uh, these areas, as well as possible activities uh, to be carried out there. Uh, you know, we, we heard already about the grazing or cranberry growing and, and so on, um, various polyculture activities. Um, also, you know, carbon farming uh, that's coming up, uh, the initiative from the European Commission. So how, you know, what, what kind of linkages we'll have there. Um, so we are trying to answer all of this and more in preparation to launching this initiative and, and the measure next year so that it is hopefully popular and attracts farmers to participate. And we are also cooperating with NGOs and other restoration experts and scientists uh, to develop uh, uh, this measure. Um, I strongly believe that collaboration is key, both to better demonstrate the urgency and the need of at scale peatland restoration, also for exchange of knowledge and best practices, uh, including the involvement of stakeholders, which is, which is why the proposal of European Peatlands Initiative is so exciting. And for a small country like Lithuania, such partnerships allow harnessing the experience and expertise of other countries, especially since we are still at the very start of our restoration journey. At the same time, I'm sure that our lessons learned uh, with this RRF measure, but also other initiatives, 
um, it will also be of great value to others. And I, um, you know, I'm hoping that I'll be, we'll be able to share these uh, uh, lessons with you in the future as well. So that's all. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, we're also very happy to have some representation from the Baltic countries at our event today. Um, next all, I would like to introduce Andrew Miller, the Chief Scientific Advisor at the Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture Department of the Scottish Government. So good morning, uh, ministers, <laughs> participants, online participants also. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be here representing not just Scottish researchers, but also Scottish government. So I'm a university scientist embedded three days a week in the Scottish government. To give you the core statistics, uh, as everybody has been, uh, Scotland, we expect about 24% peatland cover, 80% of that degraded. When peatland emissions were included in the UK's greenhouse gas inventory, Scotland's emission uh, contribution increased by 10%. So the option of ignoring peatlands is just not a, a feasible one for us. That was already well recognized. And uh, those of you who were here, here earlier uh, uh, in the morning heard about uh, Scotland's peatland action program. Since 2012, this government program administered by the Nature Scott Agency has uh, uh, dispersed about 30 million pounds worth of funding and restored more than 25,000 hectares of peatland. Scottish government committed uh, uh, last year to uh, uh, 250 million pounds of additional funding over the next 10 years, which should restore about 250,000 further hectares of peatland. So on average, we now need to restore every year the sum of all past years observed restoration. This means that our entire system is facing a capacity challenge. That applies to the science. It applies to the, the uh, uh, implementation capacity on the ground. It applies to the training capacity that trains the drivers of the diggers that will go out on, onto the peat eventually. The critical change in that program is to provide multi-year funding. So what has helped us to scale up uh, is the change from annual projects to multi-annual projects, which is ongoing right now, not helped by a COVID pandemic in the meantime. The challenge to science, the mapping challenge you know well, we've, we've heard it discussed many times, uh, the challenge to science is also to determine what's what are known as the emissions factors, that is the intensity of emission on different types of peat. It's clear that, you know, we're talking about biology, there is fantastic diversity as there always is with biology. So which peatland is emitting most? Question one, so uh, uh, we now have uh, UK wide estimates of that tier two emissions factors as they're known. But the second question is, okay, with what certainty do you know that estimate of the emissions factor? What is the error bar for researchers in the audience? So the challenge to science is now uh, 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 you know, continuing. Minister Hackett mentioned uh, the flux towers being located in Ireland to measure the, uh, this emissions intensity in different uh, areas. In Scotland also, we have a coordinated network of flux towers managed particularly by the James Hutton Institute a research institute largely funded by Scottish government. I advise on a 50 million pound uh, per year research program. We're seeking to increase the contribution of, from that research program to peatland science and to expand the network of flux towers so that we can address the emissions factors of further peatland types, not only in their current state, but also after restoration. So what's the bang for the buck? How much emissions reduction do you get from which part piece of peat at what time scale? Those emission factors that I mentioned, the estimates already include data from around all of Northwestern Europe. 
We don't have enough data for the UK and certainly not for Scotland. So it's commonplace in the scientific community to collaborate, to share data, and then to follow up with uh, uh, organizations like the Greifswald Center, uh, uh, where those data can be coordinated. So one of the strands of any peatland initiative should be to reinforce and build upon those networks of scientific collaboration, which uh, Francisco already showed on the, on the slide uh, uh, earlier. We would suggest, however, that uh, uh, the network has much more to offer. So on, um, uh, on Monday last week, uh, Cabinet Secretary Matheson signed a memorandum of understanding here uh, with the Ministry of Environment of Chile, which had 11 chapters or 11 different uh, 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 targets for uh, cooperation on the restoration of peatlands, wetlands, and other aquatic uh, ecosystems. It comprised cultural uh, uh, artifacts, cultural assets, um, research, the restoration practices, um, and you know, uh, uh, I think amongst those, the, these really interesting areas of new technologies, which give ownership of uh, restoration projects to communities. Just one initi initiative I'll highlight uh, in the Edinburgh area. I'm based in Edinburgh. Uh, we have a billion pound uh, UK and Scottish government initiative to drive, uh, to lead data-driven innovation. Part of that is known as the CivTech challenge. We also have FinTech for finance and other forms of tech. So one of the projects in the CivTech challenge, which is now in a, its second phase, is to use data aggregated into an app to uh, uh, choose the optimal areas for peatland restoration on your particular farm, your particular business. So these is, this is a way of providing tools to advisors and to landowners to give them ownership and more engagement in the process. Those of you who were here a moment ago would also have heard uh, Anne Gray talk about the process of stakeholder engagement of that Peatland Action Program. Employing people who are already locally engaged, using the social infrastructure, which may have occurred for some other reason, for deer management, for example. We had a very effective presentation uh, uh, last week on that. Finally, I should say that uh, uh, we would hope in Scotland that the European initiative would coordinate really closely with the Global Peatlands Initiative, in which UNEP has coordinated from tropical countries and now both north and south boreal and temperate peatland countries. And so any initiative that follows should work closely with uh, uh, with the GPI, not to have, uh, uh, not to dilute the European focus, but rather to expand that not that network of learning. Um, we should uh, recognise that peatland restoration is an action not only for climate change but also for biodiversity. As we look forward to COP15 in in uh, uh, in Kunming, uh, uh, we should be seeking to have peatland restoration recognised also in that context. And I'm sure that a global, uh, a European peatland initiative would seek to do exactly that. So we look forward to working with you all uh, in future in that really exciting context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, I think it's very interesting you bring up this word process and how this process of collaboration. And I think that part of why we're here today forms part of this process as well. I would now like to introduce Harm Shouten, our di uh, director at Eurosight. Thank you very much, uh, Siska. And uh, Andrew, I didn't know it was the dress code of the day. Apologies, but uh, <laughs> very nice. Thank you, ministers and speakers, for your very interesting uh, speeches. Uh, Eurosight, the, Euro the European Land Conservation Network, currently has 75 members in 24 European countries. And our members are governmental and civic society organizations working on land management. And we provide networking service all over Europe. So, um, uh, good morning. Um, we are the people with the rubber boots. Not today. I have my Christmas shoes on, but it's uh, normally we have the boots. Yeah. Uh, well, today in this climate uh, summit conversation, uh, the question is whether and how European collaboration can accelerate the recovery of peatlands. And the good thing is that we will only find answers through cooperation. But from the perspective of Eurosat members, I will mention three things that are important. 
First, we want to raise awareness. Awareness for the importance of conservation and restoration of peatlands for fighting climate emergency. So Eurostat members support the global peatland press campaign that's running right now, and the social media campaign that started in the peatland pavilion. Young students standing on boardwalks in clear words explaining why rewetting of peatlands is important for the battle against climate change. Secondly, we want to share knowledge. So although there is a good in-depth knowledge of the on the recovery of peatlands, uh, much of that knowledge remains at national level. So the Eurocide Peatland Restoration and Management Group probably is the, the first um, sustainable Europe-wide group on peatland restoration and management. And last week we had a CAPEAT event here in this peatland pavilion about uh, restoration and management. And thirdly, the most important maybe, is we want to connect to key stakeholders. For this reason, Eurocide started in 2021 an agricultural and biodiversity conservation working group with participants of over more than 15 European countries. Working for and with farmers and private landowners and communities is key to scale up. So, as a member of the European uh, of the Global Peatlands Initiative, Eurocide is willing to support the uh, the European collaboration. And this would ensure the inclusion of key organizations necessary for a successful follow-up process after COP26. I would like to conclude with a short video with a, of a recent study tour in Ireland with participants from all over Europe. I hope this video shows, despite the urgency of climate emergency, that collaboration can take place in a relaxing atmosphere. So let it be an inspiration to us all. <laughs> and the chamber is put on top of the collars and they are measuring CO2. But you should be looking at nitrous oxide, methane okay. and dissolved organic carbon and that's not taken into account here. But to, to get the... Man-made climate warming is looming with all the consequences for humanity. On top of that, our health and food supply is directly threatened by losing biodiversity and resilient ecosystems. Green nature-based solutions tackling such issues have the charm to be effective, cost-conscious, sustainable and bring back lost biodiversity. So through Eurosight and the network that it has across various European countries, we've come together, shared our experience, had an argument or two and learned a lot more about the problems that we need to solve. It's encouraging and disheartening at the same time to see what's possible and already accomplished and what's gone for good. It was originally 1,000, over 1,000 hectares. It's now about uh, 440 hectares. All of that was cut away by local people. The complex structures of bogs, their ecology and precious habitats, and their vital role for the surrounding areas are discussed by the participants. However, at the center of everything is the role peatlands must play in our fight against climate emergency. So the Natural Climate Buffer Study Tour is a collection of various different national park organizations, scientific organizations, community groups and NGOs from across Europe who all come together every second or third year to visit sites that are of real importance for the fight against climate change. Much of the great work that has been done to restore peatlands in Ireland and elsewhere in Europe are often initiated and accomplished by local volunteers and a few professional experts. For the urgently needed acceleration of peatlands restoration, such a situation is not sustainable. Climate mitigation like carbon sequestration or water retention or flood attenuation or even cultural or amenity values. And by taking all of these people together, visiting various sites, we learn from each other and can bring those lessons back to our own national parks to hopefully make a larger difference together. Everyone involved in this study tour agreed that community involvement is critical to restoring peatlands to wet and healthy habitats. This stops their greenhouse gas emissions and turns them into carbon intakers. 
but communities can't be left in the cold in the fight against the climate emergency. There's much more political and societal support needed. We have no time to waste. Brilliant. Thank you for that video and for your words. Uh, I would now like to introduce Aldert von Vieren. Aldert is a cattail farmer from the Wetlands Products Foundation. So he'll be joining us online. Unfortunately, normally he's quite famous for his rubber boots as well. But uh, no, I don't think we can see them today. <laughs> Go ahead, Aldert. Okay, thank you for inviting. And um, uh, one uh, word uh, in front, uh, I hear a lot of uh, strategies uh, action programs, but I can assure you this does not make it easier for a farmer on drain peatland to shift to uh, wet uh, agriculture or polluticulture. I'll uh, try to show. Um, there's a bit, bit more text in my in my slides as normally. That's easier for reading back. Uh, the issue is very simple: no emissions in 2050. So uh, we need to do something pretty fast and um, it's not difficult because you only have to put water on land which uh, we know because we can also take it out so we can let it in again um, but it will end for instance in the Netherlands and in parts of Germany the traditional high-end industry diary industry and this diary industry is holding uh, a heavy toll also on the future programs so there is a lot to do. Uh, the urgency is also clear, 1.2 million hectares in, in Germany, 240,000 uh, hectares in uh, the Netherlands and 171 uh, in, 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 in Denmark. Denmark will make nature from it, but the other uh, things we can, uh, we need those fields. They can bring high yields, even in very dry years, which we had some of them in the last five years, two on a row. And uh, they can also be the base of a bio-based circular economy, which is something we want to do similarity. And the particles you see here on the left uh, made from uh, cattail, for instance, but also from reed or wetland hay uh, can be used for creating almost everything. Um, you'll see this nice price scaling you can build houses from it which have a negative carbon dioxide uh, footprint and those houses don't have to look very uh, old or uh, cottage style Laura Ashley this is a modern villa in the Netherlands with a uh, reed on the roof uh, but you can make single-use tableware from the fibers of cattail and uh, you can use these fibers seven times like cellulose before you have to burn them and even when you burn them you get your energy come. You can make uh, the Netherlands want to go off the gas because that's also a fossil thing. In Germany, we want to go on the gas to change from coal to uh, completely renewable. But uh, cattle, as you see here, but also reed and uh, uh, grasses and uh, sedges can be used for uh, producing green biogas. And one of the very nicest thing is imagine uh, growing cattle on formerly drained or excavated peatlands because they wanted to make substrates from them and now we can make those substrates from those biomass from polluticulture so the knife cuts on both sides uh, but what is hampering all these things i run in against roadblocks everywhere where i try to do this um, there's a one big problem which is macroeconomically so even small farmers have to deal with these things. It's very strange that a uh, drained peat soil which emits 20 tons of carbon dioxide has uh, a value in Amsterdam of 60,000 euros. When this peatland is rewetted, the value it losses up to 6,000 euros. So this wet rewetted peatland, which does not emit 20 tons and where the crop can also uh, contain from the air by photosynthesis uh, 20 or 30 tons carbon dioxide is only worth 6,000 euros and uh, the drained one 60,000 euros. So the farmer can't get a mortgage or a loan on this wet peatland. And the banks 
who created this system over the last 150 years and have uh, 8 billion euros standing out on mortgages on drain peat, they say we have no problem because the depreciation is going to start with the farmer. He goes bankrupt, not me. This has to change. It will not change. It's on the table of the minister president of the Netherlands. But the system likes to be this way because the banks have the power. This is very difficult for a farmer to get out of this to start doing something. Dry peatlands are used to get rid of all the manure. And when you rewet them, you are not allowed to put uh, manure or fertilizer on them. This is very good. You're just not going to uh, manure or fertilize uh, rewetted peatland because then you're uh, creating a, a bad situation for your water. Uh, and the nice thing is uh, cattle and reed is cleaning water. Another thing is there's a lot of intensives for eco schemes on drained peatland, also in the new cap, but there are no so many, many things for biodiversity on a rewetted agriculture. So there's no, there's money for somebody who, is, who drains and rewets a bit, but there's not so much money for somebody who, who rewets completely. There are no payments at all for all the other ecosystem services like water retention, water cleaning, and higher biodiversity. Uh, why do we need more cooperation? It's very simple. Uh, there is pilot projects in the whole of Europe. I traveled to, to a lot of them, but uh, not everybody is knowing what the other guys are doing or girls. And uh, so there is done a lot on one thing and forgotten a lot of other things. For instance, these economical problems are not tackled anywhere. So more cooperation is needed. And uh, it's easy to, uh, to harvest uh, mice from uh, sandy soil, but it's something totally different to uh, work on rewetted peat with a very low uh, soil pressure and uh, you'll need very uh, explicit uh, new machinery and there should be more cooperation in um, working away from this very old Danish design. The machines are there, but they are not on an international size. And uh, this is for the EU member states, paludiculture. My kind of farming, what I'm doing, is in the new cap, but it's not clearly distinguished what I am going to do there. It just, they say, okay, you are the same as normal uh, agriculture, but uh, the fact is that in those strategic plans, there's not much standing about it. I hope this will be changed, but it's needed because otherwise it will not work. You have seen this one by Francisca Tannenberger. Be sure to realize this is a European and not only a situation from Brussels out. Thanks for watching. And the last slide is the uh, practical side of um, paludiculture, which you see here, which is the Polder Bergmeers in the north of Amsterdam, which will be rewetted uh, and grown with cattle in the next five years for 20 hectares to create biomass for the circular economy in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. We're all very happy to have um, a more underground perspective here today at the event from a cattail farmer and for all your work with the Wetland Products Foundation. Next up, we have another online speaker. We have Shane Regan, who is from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, as well as the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, who are responsible for peatlands in Ireland. Thank you, Siska. And uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm delighted to talk to the COP and I'm going to present some of the work I'm doing with my colleagues in the National Parks and Wildlife Service on developing a peatland observation and restoration network in Ireland and how that can feed into the work that's been done across Europe and how we can work together on some of the challenges that we all face. And I think that's very clear in the, the talks today. And I myself, I mean, I'm, I'm a dub, I'm a, I'm a city guy, but I'm, I'm really a bogger at heart, like some, so some of the audience. And this is actually me as a toddler uh, on my grandfather's turf in rural Ireland in the 1980s. And, you know, at that time, I mean, people had no choice but to use peat to, to, to heat their homes. But that has changed. Uh, you know, we, we've got different energies, different ways of retrofitting homes, and that type of thing. And, and, and that's great. And obviously, there's big political challenges to actually rolling that across, you know, places like Ireland and other places of the world. But in the terms of context of this talk, I mean, we're, we're very aware now that we need to conserve, protect and restore peatlands to help us cool the climate. And I purposely say here, like, like it used to do, 
because it's clear from a lot of the talks from Germany and Lithuania and, and Iceland that there's been so much degradation that peatlands are now a big source of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So they're, 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 they're warming the climate and not cooling it like, like they used to do. And that's the case in Ireland too. We've had a long history of degradation uh, for energy extraction, land conversion, forestry, that, that type of thing. Around 17% of our land is conserved, but you know only a small proportion of that is actually in good condition. And what it means overall is that peatlands is a big source of carbon in Ireland. We estimate maybe six to 10 million tonnes of CO2 per year. But we're very aware of that and the conversation has changed. And I think that's been very clear here too today that over the past few years, the, the, the number of restoration projects in Ireland has increased uh, enormously. A lot of state uh, uh, funded projects, a lot of European uh, funded projects, and, and I've got them here on, on the slide. And, and the aim here, yeah, is to arrest emissions and in time start to get these peatlands, you know, sequestering carbon again. And it's and a huge amount of money is going into it, over 150 million uh, euros. We're probably looking at something between 50 and 100,000 uh, hectares of land being restored currently and more to come in the, in the coming years. And obviously, this is very important to reach our net zero uh, targets uh, as across the world. And how do we know that this type of work that we do will work? Well, we, we do similar practices to elsewhere. We, we, we block drains and that type of thing. But we measure what we report. And we, the data and results we collect have, have, have informed the Climate Action Plan. Our, our current one was just released last week. And we report this to EPA in their, their greenhouse gas inventory, part of Lulu CF. And our approach is an integrated approach in terms of the monitoring. We, we measure ecology in terms of mapping, species identification, that type of thing hydrometry, measuring water levels, runoff, and you can see some examples on the slides, and the carbon exchange. So we, we measure all the, 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 these uh, parameters uh, you know, uh, to, together to give us the greatest insights into how to manage these systems. And we have some uh, observation sites which we'll look at in a moment. We also, so that's obviously empirical based, but there's also schemes where, where it's more qualitative. We're looking at the, the, uh, the condition of the land and coming up with habitat scores. And that is a results-based schemes. So uh, there's a project called Farm Peat, and uh, Minister Hackett mentioned it earlier, another one called Wild Atlantic Nature. We're basically, we're awarding farmers for carrying out practices that aid in their conservation and restoration objectives for particular peatland sites in, in, in Ireland. But in terms of our observation network, where, where we're measuring you know, different scientific uh, uh, parameters, we're looking at a suite of different peatlands. So we're looking at kind of peatlands in a near natural condition. This is Clara Bog, who's actually on the uh, Eurosite video, where, where the guys visited there a few weeks ago. We're looking at uh, transition mire, and, and we're carrying out all of these different measurements and just trying to get an understanding of what the baseline condition is, what we're aiming for, basically. We're also looking at cut over sites and, and cut away sites. Uh, and this is an example here to, to our left, where we're currently carrying out restoration work. And last summer, we measured emissions as high as 18 tonnes per hectare, which is extremely high. Uh, because Ireland, like everywhere else, is, is getting warmer and this particular area is quite, is quite heavily drained, but we're restoring it and we're going to measure the impact of that and basically communicate the, the value of our work uh, in terms of uh, climate mitigation and, and, and that type of thing. And, and currently there's an enormous project being carried out by Borden and Mona, which you mentioned a couple of times today. I mean, they were a pre-extraction company, but they're, they're going through a transition. Uh, and they're currently uh, in, in the, uh, restoring 33,000 hectares of bog land. It's probably the biggest project of its kind in Europe, I would say. And we are the regulators of national parks as part of that. And as part of that, they're also putting out Eddie Covariance Towers and the like, and Trinity College Dublin are carrying out research at some of these sites. As an example, you can see here just a, a site that was produced for, for, uh, for peat extraction and energy and how that's being restored with, with berms and dams and the thing. And that has wetted up quite nicely. And we're going to monitor that over the next five years and probably beyond that too. And we're doing some work up in the uplands. Uh, here on the, on, the, on the west side of the country, there's the Wild Atlantic Nature Project where it's covering an enormous amount uh, of, of land. And we're going to measure the carbon exchange in an area that was forested. We're going to, to take away those, those conifer trees, measure the impact of that, that management on the carbon exchange. And on the east side of the country, we're actually working with Intel on funding a restoration project because Intel uses a, a huge amount of water in their manufacturing process. Uh, so it's of great benefit to them to have the peatlands in good condition. So we're, we're, we're carrying out that type of work. And in terms of the European network, I mean, it's been mentioned today, just there, there are already different programs, there are already different uh, uh, you know, research activities, that type of thing. And today, just these countries alone have spoken at just this, this, uh, this, this pavilion. 
And I think the thing to do now is to connect all of the countries, to connect those different networks, to, to connect to different programs and to exchange that knowledge. And I think the previous talk described quite nicely uh, about that. So for example, in the Netherlands and Germany, there's a lot of experience with plodding culture and, you, and you know, using the farmlands uh, for, for climate gain. We haven't done that type of work in Ireland. We've been mainly working on uh, the, the, the high bogs and the natural systems. So there's a lot to be gained by working together in, 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 a, in a European uh, initiative as, as the point of this, this pavilion. So I'll summarize in this. Yeah, I think the importance of the European network is to use the information that we measure to make decisions regarding policy management. Long-term monitoring, I think, is critical. Uh, we're, we're behind in that, but we're, we're, we're getting there, I think, to advance our understanding and to make that available, data available to, to scientists across, across, across Europe to work together and further our insights and, and aid, ultimately, in the restoration of the peatlands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. It's very interesting to see all these common challenges. I think so we're, we've had a lot of these sound bites, quite quick snaps, but it's also interesting to see how they have a very common thread throughout. I would now like to introduce our last speaker from this section, which is Hans Schutten, the program head of Climate Smart Land Use at Wetlands International. Thank you, Siska, um, esteemed. Um um, ministers that are here in part of the audience, but also all the people here in the audience and also online. Thank you for giving me time to talk. And, ooh, how shall I follow up from all these esteemed speakers? That's not easy, is it? A lot of it been said and a lot of it has already been talked about. But let's hark back, about, uh, uh, hark back a little bit. Who are we as Wetlands International? We are the global NGO that responsible and that drive forward um, peatland of uh, wetland conservation and restoration. But if you look, think about our motto and where we are, we inspire and mobilize society to safeguard and restore wetlands for people and for nature. So what we can bring to this budding initiative is that we can bring the, 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 um, the worldwide perspective. Because let's be really honest, what we are ta here talking about at the moment in Europe and bringing an initiative has already been done across, uh, across the world. When I think about the work that we've been doing um, since the turn of the century in Indonesia, whereby we've created sustainable business models for the Indonesian farmers to understand how we can bring sustainable livelihoods and marry that with the protection and the maintenance of the peatlands and the maintenance of the high carbon in, in, in there. So it's really important to build on that. As I said, Wetlands International has been going for more than 40 years. And we're, we've got that, that, um, that global perspective that we can, can bring to bear. On peatlands, um, we've been going since, the be, the be, uh, since the, before the end of the last um, century. And we stood at the cradle of building that knowledge base, which is actually essential to the all, the all the work that we were talking about here today. So from that global perspective, we can bring that in there and really can make it, make it work, make it work for communities. Because if there is one thing that we've learned across the world is people need to be at the center of the solutions. If we do not create long-term sustainable business models, if we do not create buy-in from the people on the ground and from the communities of the ground, then we can have projects, but we won't have longevity. We need to get in there and we need to get in between the people and in the mind of the people in the communities. Whether or not that is in Scotland, whether or not that is in Iceland, or whether or not that is an island, sustainable business solutions are absolutely key. So let's think about those four concepts that we've been talking about quite a bit and have been talking about over the last hour and a bit. So at first of all, we need the knowledge. Where are the peatlands? Yeah, and in what state are they? And what kind of carbon emissions are asso associated with it? What kind of biodiversity values are associated with it? And what kind of economic opportunities are associated with that? So that knowledge is key. key. But let's also be very clear that knowledge needs to be not only within the protected areas, but also outside the protected areas. Because the, the challenge outside the protected areas is much greater than within the protected areas. So there are a series of projects and the knowledge base is already there. Um, Francisca from Greifswald My Meyer Center already showed that amalgamated wetland map 2.0 with really show a peatland map 2.0, sorry, and I really jump across here wrongly, whereby we show the 
the, the current state of knowledge of peatlands across the, across the globe. That's really critical and that's really important, but we need to build on that. A million square kilometers of peatlands in Europe across 45 countries. So it's a European wide problem, wider than the European Union across the European continent. There is really interesting projects starting to happen at this moment outside this initiative. For example, a re recently funded European um, research project called Waterlands that really brings together the knowledge on how to de develop and deliver sustainable and long-term success successful restoration projects based around finance, based about ecology, based around hydrology, based about projects rooted up and rooted in society and the comes around it. So let's build on these uh, initiatives and let's include them. And let's not try to reinvent the wheel with this initiative, as important as it is. And that's great what, what, what's already there. The second important uh, thing is practice. How do we do and how do we restore these peatlands across Europe? And there is a lot there that we can bring in. We've got experience in Russia whereby after the, the devastating 2010 fire, 2010 fires with 50,000 excess deaths due to smog coming from burning peatlands, we've restored over 100,000 um, hectares of peatlands there. Well, let's bring that knowledge back into again. From there, via the work and that's been done um, with, with budding projects at this moment in time across Europe, together, for example, with re Rewilding Europe. But also, let's really drill down in that. Let's not only make it government-focused, but let's look at the business, business initiatives as well. There are clear budding business initiatives that, that are willing and capable of actually restoring the, the peatlands, purely based on, on the business initiative. Let's pick that up. Because let's be really honest, as governments across Europe, we can set the framework, we can set the infrastructure, but we haven't got the money to restore all these peatlands. That's, uh, that's far outstrips the budget that we have. So we need to talk to business to deliver this on the ground. The third important component in the, that square that I always see that's outlined successful peatland restoration projects is the policy. Policy is absolutely critical. And whether or not it is in, in, at European level, we talked about CAP and this, um, 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 sub, um, adverse and really per perverse subsidies that are still um, um, supporting drainage rather than restoration. Let's work together on that and make sure that that is not happening anymore. And let's have a concerted voice in Europe. Wetlands International is working through a combination and has got um, an, uh, a a group of um, like-minded organizations, and we've got a European association that's got a strong voice in, in, in Brussels. Let's use that and let's build on there and let's use this initiative to amplify that. We've got member states and we've got members within governments. Let's use this contact. We've got members within civil society. Let's use that and build upon that. What is clear within me thinking about it, one that I haven't seen a lot of, is the European environment agencies. Whether or not they are the environment agencies within individual countries or the European environment, uh, European environment agency across Europe, and then including Russia as well. Because through, if we really truly want to, um, want to restore peatlands, we are starting to impact hydrology. We're starting to work on, on impacts on water quality, water quantity, and people's livelihoods. So the European Environment Agencies and the European Environment Agency needs to be dovetailed to the, in, into this. Otherwise, this will be a really good initiative, but it won't deliver on the ground. And as Wetlands Internationally, one thing that we really want to do here is make this an initiative that delivers on the ground and not another talking group. So knowledge, practice, policy, and the last thing to touch on is finance. And thank you. And uh, so I'm wrapping up with the finance. So finance is an interesting topic, and already some people to spoke about that. So on finance, we see a range of initi in initiatives in terms of carbon finance starting to happen in the, across Europe, from the carb from the Moors Futures in Germany to the Peatland Code in uh, in the UK to an, a budding Peatland Code in Ireland to something similar in Poland to something similar in Lithuania and the Baltic states as well. Do we really need all these different codes? Do, or do we need, need to make sure that they align? If they align, we're powerful and we can access international finance. So maybe let's use this initiative as well to bring, to think about that, to how we can bring those, those carbon in it, um, finance together. 
lasting around finance. It's not only about carbon, it's about an, carbon is a part of a blended finance solution. So it can be subsidies to kick things off. It can be carbon finance to, as a long-term sustainable future because the, the businesses, as we said earlier on, as Andrew Muller clearly said, businesses lead, need long-term security to invest. That's critical, otherwise this won't happen. But also within there, it needs to be based upon where possible about sustainable long-term products coming from these from these uh, countries and from these fields and whether or not that is these are berries or this is Fagnum or this is Reed or there might be some or Typha or some really other opportunities that needs to be blended together in long-term sustainable business models. So yes, what I'm trying to say over the last five minutes is Wetlands International has got the knowledge, has got the experience from a global level. We're more than happy and we're really willing to play a part in it, but let's bring all the parties around the table that are critical in that, including, for example, the European Environment Agency and others. There's really good initiatives all on, on that. Let's build on that and let's move, move forward together. I think this will be a, a success and I think there is a real big chance of success. Um, and let's move forward and talk about that. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. And thank you, Siska, for moderating the event very well. And uh, we have still a bit of time left for the discussion about, um, because what we see now today is that there is um, really some interest from several European countries and organizations and stakeholders to start working and shaping and discussing a possible European collaboration for peatlands. And um, so we will have a short Q&A to be able to discuss and think about it, how we can shape it together. And I would like to invite Mr. Malcolm Noonan and Mr. Uh, Gundranson. Maybe you can take a place here in the front together. And then we have some questions for you. And I would like the audience, um, there are already a lot of uh, questions in the chat, but please ask your questions. We might have some time to, to take up some questions especially the ones that I like mostly. So um, thank you for that. Well, <coughs> um, I will start with Mr. Um, uh, Goodbranson. Um, yeah, you have the microphone, that's good. Um, Thank you very much for your talk today. And um, as you heard, um, there's a lot of interest. Uh, everybody speaks about connecting to different stakeholders. Uh, several stakeholders were here today in several sectors. So we would love to hear from you how a European Peatlands Initiative could benefit and best achieve a multi-stakeholder approach. Yeah. Um well, thank you for inviting me to begin with. Um, it's been a, a real journey here today to listen to all the, the, the different people who have contributed here. Um, in, in my opinion, I think that what we will mostly gain from a European cooperation like this is that we can share knowledge. And by sharing knowledge, I mean sharing scientific knowledge to begin with which is important because that is one of the um, issues that have, uh, have been sort of uh, lacking, um, at least in, in my country, to better build the uh, understanding of why this is so important to restore these ecosystems and protect those that already haven't been disturbed. Now, secondly, I think that um, learning from each other on the actual ground where uh, contractors, the way that they actually restore the different kinds of ecosystems, because that's a technical work, and I think we can learn from each other uh, on, on that basis. We can also learn from each other when it, when it comes to um, uh, stakeholder engagement, and especially with landowners. Um, the Soil Conservation Service of Iceland, which was founded in 1907, has gone through a several phases in the way that they have approached stakeholders. Stakeholders are mostly farmers at home. 
And in their work in trying to um, protect soils and vegetation, uh, to restore it, um, they have gone through uh, sort of, I, I would say, from a very highly top-down to bottom-up approach. So in 1990, uh, the, the, the Institute started more working more closely with farmers and putting in uh, programs with uh, money um, to encourage farmers to be participants in this work. And I think we can learn a lot from each other, all these, these, these uh, uh, countries, on what is really the best practice. Because us human beings, we are quite similar when it comes to it. We need to know what's in it for us. We need to know why is it beneficial for for uh, me as a farmer, uh, and then if there is additionally something that benefits, uh, you know, the, the greater society, that is a, a, a plus for everyone. Um, so I think that these are the main issues we can learn from each other. I'm not going to take up all the time, just going to mention one more, and that is the sort of governmental policy making at that stage I think we can also learn from from each other thank you very much the very nice remarks you made here um, I would like to go over to the to the both the Irish ministers and let's start with um, Minister Hackett uh, who joined us online again thank you very much coming back thank, thank, thank you Harm and yep. um, yeah I think look you know, where, where, where do we go from here? I mean, obviously, today is a great start um, and to hear from all the, the different um, countries and, and how they, I mean, the similarities are, are quite, star you know, quite, quite stark, it's particularly from a farming perspective with, with certainly with Ireland and Iceland, I can see a lot of similar um, similar um, concerns and similar reactions. Um, I think clearly we need to, I think we do need to establish the, the fundamental needs of the various stakeholders and keep those into in our minds. So from a farming perspective, the farmers still want to farm the land in some way. They don't want to abandon it and move away. So I think there's a sensitivity there, how we um, permit you know, a certain level perhaps of, of farming, whether it's with animals or, or otherwise, I think that's important. I think the linkages we can create out of this initiative are, are going to be hugely important. Um, and clearly things like knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer for are, are, are crucial to us working collectively for this. Um, I think there are examples of this collaborative approach already across the EU. Um, you will, um, and I think you know there are inspiring networks such as the, the Glo Global Peatlands Initiative, the German Moor Dialogue, and indeed the Nordic Council of Ministers offer good practice, best practice models for this collaboration. So I think that's worth looking into. Um, again, the stakeholder engagement, getting communities on board, and we've seen how successful that can be in our country. We're still you know, some of these projects are still in their early stage, but once you get the communities on board and they fully understand what, what we're trying to do, um, why it's of benefit and, and why it's, it's essential we, we, we do these things, I, I, you know, you've, you've crossed half, you've, you've achieved half the battle at that stage, I think, uh, and we've seen where that hasn't worked as well in Ireland, where we've a, a top down approach just doesn't work and, and farmers certainly of all stakeholders don't tend to engage very, very well with that when they're essentially told what to do. So I think engaging from a grassroots level and moving up, I think it's always a lesson we have learned certainly here. Um, and look, really, I suppose, again, informing people of the why we're doing it and the, and the value it can add and those ecosystem services I spoke about earlier. So I think there is also, I suppose, finally to finish, there is an important role here um, for this initiative to really feed back into the European policy making decision, um, policy making pro process for peatlands and certainly helping member states to create common standards and cohesive policy mechanisms for this area. So I do look forward to engaging um, fully and our country engaging in this initiative and um, you know all we, if we what we can learn together to deliver for um, you know improved peatlands across Europe I think will be will be hugely beneficial so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Hackett. It's, uh, I really like that you say we, we don't start from scratch. We're building up what already is there. And we have a very uh, interesting year ahead of us in, in, as a learning process. Um, Minister Noonan, if I may ask you, um, how do you think uh, we can 
start shaping the European Peatlands Initiative and, and building the collaboration together. Thanks, yeah. And I think um, from our perspective, Pippa has summed it up quite well from, uh, I think the, the important elements around knowledge sharing and communications are going to be vital uh, to, to such an initiative. And, and certainly we've heard uh, throughout the, the course of this morning um, that this work is already well underway. Uh, there's, there, you know, we see it with this publication that was produced uh, many, many years ago, uh, led in Dublin, that, that um, the, the scientists are already working together. I think it's the communities. I think the, the event that was, uh, that we, was highlighted in, in your video earlier in, in terms of the, um, the, the, carb, the uh, carbon buffers in Abbey Leaks Bog and, and uh, the, the uh, partners in Ireland, I think that was a really wonderful initiative and shows a, a really important way forward. I think too that, that uh, critically important to it all is around, uh, as Pippa has said, participation of communities, uh, bringing people on board, engaging communities, um, and that people are at the centre of the solutions that, we, that we're proposing, because we, we simply can't do it without that. Um, and I think there's, there are probably significant no knowledge gaps still there, but there, I, I think the research projects that we've seen uh, on show here this morning, have sh uh, right across Europe, have, have shown how the science is consolidating and, and showing a common way forward, uh, both through the appropriate hydrological measures that are required to reduce carbon emissions, but also um, uh, from uh, uh, the other uh, initiatives that are taking place. So I suppose the the ongoing work that we have to do is around sharing um, the work that we have and, and the experience that we have on our peatlands um, through different forms and scientific community and the existing peatland projects and the institutions and governments and landowners that have worked together to enhan enhance uh, the interfaces between science, policy and practice and move towards a, pro a positive outcome for peatlands. And I think this has to be done in a wholly inclusive and a collaborative manner. So I think that's really important. So I really think as well that it's up to countries in particular who are privileged to hold significant areas of peatlands to shape any future of a, of a European peatlands initiative and agree on a, a, a common process of development and structure of an organisation and, and governance and taking into consideration the broad range of stakeholder inputs. So um, I, I think we're, we're in, in a good place for this. You know, I think there's, I, I certainly feel very inspired by what I've heard this morning uh, by the, the various activities that are taking place here. And um, it, for me, it augurs well for uh, a, a common sense of purpose around this initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. Noonan. Yeah. You may applaud. <laughs> <coughs> Um, well, there are many questions in the chat. Um, I wanted to, to, to highlight one of them, and maybe one of you, um, maybe Mi Minister Kubranson or uh, Minister Hackett, uh, maybe you can respond both to this question, is um, what story do we tell? Um, eh, how do we frame wet peatlands as progress in, con in contrast to the outdated understanding of drainage as pro pro progress? Eh, you, you both touched upon it uh, eh, from a historical perspective. Um, but how, how do we s tell this story? Can I ask one of you to say something about it? Or mm -hmm. If not, no problem. Well, I, I can start <laughs> um, very briefly. Um, how do we tell the story? I think um, when you're telling stories, there are certain uh, elements that you always have to make sure that are in there. And the elements that build up trust. So you have to tell the truth to begin with. You have to, if the, uh, if the science is not, uh, well, let me put it this way. If you, if you don't have all the science there, then you have to say, well, there are uncertainties, but um, all scientific work is um, pointing to the direction that it is the, in, in this way or, or, or that way. And we are getting more and more science to underpin uh, what we are doing. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, I think we need to approach this also in a very positive manner. We have to approach it from the perspective of the farmer and landowner, him or herself, um, that uh, it can also benefit the local community. We should involve the farmers themselves in uh, restoring the wetlands because that brings money into the community it brings better understanding why we are doing this and we should um, we should really engage in talking to people about why it is important 
why it's important for the individual farm, how they can decrease their carbon emissions, how it's important on a regional and, uh, and on, a, on a national scale. I think these are the most important um, elements in, in how we, we tell this story. And we should always aim at um, or, or strive for a success and try to get people to feel like they are part of, um, or they, they are real participants and really contributing to a success which has to happen to not only save the planet, but to uh, save lives and livelihoods. Pretty inspiring. <laughs> I'm just going to respond yep. briefly, if that's all right. Yep. Yeah, um, I think another thing, I th particularly from a, a farming perspective and, and farmers, is, is the sort of definition of what a productive farmer is. You know, it's very narrow definition. It's all about producing food and um, meat or milk or whatever the case may be. But I think a productive farmer should be defined in a much broader sense and certainly in delivering those ecosystem services might well be more valuable to us as a, as a society moving forward um, and if you can do that in conjunction with um, producing food maybe produce a bit less but it is of a higher value because you're using maybe those animals in conjunction with the landscape to, 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 to manage those lands um, I think just to think about that and about how productive um, farmers can be into the future um, beyond just producing food. And I think that if we broaden that that definition, um, I think that will help, you know, with the story and with bringing people along as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, then I would like to end the Q&A session uh, here. Um, I really thank you for, and also the audience, for all the questions and the interest in this, and but mostly the Irish government for uh, hosting this initiative. Very happy about it. Um, and I think we can conclude that there's a lot of interest, a lot of um, organizations and uh, national governments and stakeholders are interested in, in, in the upcoming year to work together. Um, and I would like to hand over to Diana Kopanski. Um, she will uh, present us a call to action. And she is, of course, one of the initiators of the Peatland Pavilion. And she's the coordinator at the Global Peatlands Initiative. Welcome, Diana. Looks yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. Your excellencies, dynamic speakers, peatlands enthusiasts, and people around the world. My name is Diana Kopansky, and I work for the United Nations Environment Program, and I have the honor to lead the Global Peatlands Initiative. It's an international partnership working to save peatlands as the largest terrestrial organic carbon stock. And over the past five years, we've grown to a partnership of 46 different organizations, from youth groups to NGOs to academia, networks, and private se sector innovators. We are a diverse group of GPI partners and many more working in collaboration for the benefit of all. And in the past years, I've seen a number of emerging regional initiatives emerging from ASEAN region, Patagonia Peatlands Initiative, a strengthening network across the tropics, Canada, and now this discussion for Europe. It's really a pleasure that I have the opportunity to listen to your exchanges. This discussion has been building over the past years, and honestly, it is wonderful to see the momentum of an idea shared amongst many uh, along my peatlands journey through Europe, uh, transforming into a will and a desire for action here and now. I'd like to share with you all a call to action and invite you to leap over the lessons of those who've gone before you and be the change makers for nature, for climate, and for people. The climate and nature actions needed to need to include conserving, restoring, and sustainably managing our precious peatlands. Although peatlands are estimated to cover at least 3% of the global land surface area, they hold at least 30% of the world's terrestrial soil carbon. Soil carbon. Uh, it's about as twice as much carbon as in all the world's forests combined. In many European countries, 
peatlands have been degraded and converted to other land uses. And although there is good in-depth knowledge on the importance of improving soil and water systems and facilitating innovative restoration and recovery of peatlands, much of that knowledge remains at the national level. We've seen the benefits of sharing and exchanging peer-to-peer -peer and across disciplines, across sectors and regions and cultures. And so in close cooperation with the Global Peatlands Initiative, today at the COP in the Peatlands Pavilion, national governments and stakeholders have expressed their interest in joining forces to exchange experience, knowledge, and inspire critical joint action for peatlands through a dedicated European Peatlands Initiative. We do bring a uh, belief that stronger collaboration will accelerate and enable action for peatlands restoration and protection. Through consultations, the shaping of a European peatlands initiative can do many things. We can gather governments of all peatland countries to work together toward increasing the protection, rewetting, restoration, and sustainable management of peatlands in line with our commitment to implement the United Nations Environment Assembly Number no. 4 Resolution on Peatlands. We can raise awareness for the importance of peatlands in fighting the interconnected climate and nature emergency. We can acknowledge the different sectors who are working towards sustainable management of peatlands and join them up. We can stimulate exchanges on sustainable livelihoods, wet use of peatlands, including recreation, polluticulture, education, and help advance the research on alternative sources of growing media. And we can also pilot financial in incentives together to close the financial gap for peatlands and nature. In the coming year, I would like to see the European Peatlands Initiative further shape itself. And the Global Peatlands Initiative partners stand ready to support you in this journey. So we call on all people, governments, farmers, conservationists, businesses, bankers, artists, historians, and scientists to gather together and increase your ambition and actions for peatlands to meet the climate and nature targets. Let's work together, not in competition, but in collaboration. I am very grateful for your expression of interest and the true spirit of collaboration. Thank you so much for your work. That was excellent, Diana. Thank you very much for your words and your call to action. Um, well, before I hand over to Minister Noonan for the, the final remarks, I would like to invite uh, the attendants here, um, in a physically present, for a group photo after the session. So please stay on and um, without masks, please, we can make a, a group photo together. Minister Noon. Thank you. Um, I have to say that was a really uh, inspiring session and really um, from, I, I suppose we spent a bit of time, all of us uh, espousing our bogger credentials uh, here this morning, but I think we all have bogger credentials. I think we are all boggers because we love bogs, and I think that's um, the common thread that I have from from today's session. And I want to thank everyone for the the warm welcome we received here this morning at the Peatlands Pavilion. It's the first place we landed at COP, and it's it's just fantastic. It's um, great um, commonality and great sense of purpose about um, what we're trying to achieve. We're all here today at this dialogue because we see value in our peatlands. To some, that is a biodiversity value, it's a climate mitigation contribution as a source of economic support or its intrinsic link to our cultural past, among others. Globally, however, these, these values are not yet fully realized and achieving the status of sustainably managed and intact peatlands is still an aspiration in some countries rather than a fully developed and financed plan. For those countries that are on the right paths for a better outcome for peatlands, after what we've heard over the last two weeks at COP26, this journey must now proceed with a sense of urgency. We must continue to map, monitor, monitor and assess. Policies can be adopted and adapted for more efficient and effective peatland conservation, restoration and sustainable management as new evidence and work practices emerge. 
we can look at alternative models of investment for peatlands restoration, like we are doing in Ireland. To those countries who are at the start of their peatlands management programmes, we can offer our experience and our technical assistance. In this UN decade of ecosystem restoration, the time is right to build momentum for the conservation of peatlands. With Europe's new Green Deal as, uh, and the setting of ambitions, em emissions reduction and restoration targets, awareness and enthusiasm for environmental and climate related action has never been higher. This peatlands pavilion, which has hosted a multitude of conversations amongst like-minded international experts, government officials and numerous stakeholders from across Europe and beyond over this week, have brought significant awareness to peatlands. And my hope is that we can harness the positive energy and momentum created over the past two weeks and through new and existing initiatives, work towards an alliance between European countries who are ready to take action for peatlands. By working together, we can make collective knowledge and experience available and enable more conservation projects. The first step, as Minister Hackett outlined, in any future pan-European peatlands initiative is to set out a clear approach to establish the fundamental needs of all the various stakeholders. So as an initial step, I am offering to host in Ireland the first forum to discuss the shaping of such a European peatlands initiative in early 2022. This will hopefully be the first of many forums as we can work towards building a network between our respective countries and indeed engage with others who are interested in shaping this journey, in sharing this journey. Though there are a few countries here today, we want everyone to come together. This forum will be open and inclusive to all. At this forum, we could set out how a memo of understanding roadmap could act as a springboard to shape the functions and activities of any collaboration. Ireland can work on an initial outlook at this in advance, and that could be used to stimulate and drive discussions in such a forum. In conclusion, it is very clear that peatlands restoration and conservation offer a nature-based solution to biodiversity loss and climate change and can aid in a just transition for people and communities. The message must be promoted and shared widely. On a final note, I wish to thank the UN Environment Programme and the Global Peatlands Initiative and all the partners and supporters for creating such an impressive global platform for peatlands here at COP26. It has put peatlands as a key nature-based solution in the heart of the climate discussions. A huge thank you to, to our moderator, Siska and Harm, for your wonderful work, really, uh, really appreciate it, and to all our speakers and our contributors here today, both online and in person. And I want to wish you all a, a safe journey home from COP26. I do hope we have good outcomes from the main COP. I look forward to seeing uh, some of you uh, and, and both here and next year. As we leave here today, please reflect on what can be achieved if we collaborate more. We, may, we must continue these conversations. Remember that alone we can only do so much, but together we can do so much more. Gormila Mahagut August Togabogeh.